Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another Everyday Trader. This is Eric Hale with Trader Oasis, and I'm joined by Greg Jensen. What's happening, Greg? Good afternoon, everybody. It's good afternoon, anyway. I know you're watching this whenever in YouTube land. So YouTube land, so it's one more time. So 2, 2 a.m., good, good in the middle of the night. Somebody's watching at 2 a.m. <laughs> My son watches YouTube at 2 a.m. I'm sure he does. He he learns the most random facts. I love YouTube. There's so much stuff out there. It's crazy. You want to know how to fix a 1972 um, Honda Civic carburetor? There's a there's probably five videos on it. You know. Like, yep. It's crazy. You want to know the best fertilizer to use to grow the ideal carrots in a zone seven? I like to. I live in zone. I don't even know if I live in zone seven. My wife can tell. Anyway. Yes, welcome. It's good to be with you all. Um, had a uh, little bit of volatility today in the market. We won't necessarily dive a ton into it, but um, some news came out today as well. CPI print. Eric, what do you think? Yeah, that's what we primarily wanted to talk about. Uh, the intraday moves, you and I are trying to figure out what's going on there. And um so people should tune into the daily market updates at Options Animal, where we dive a little deeper into the, um, to the to the daily action and what's happening. But big print today, probably the more important, probably second most important economic report for the month. Um, that is after jobs report is the the inflation data, and the CPI gets a lot of attention. The big part of it is because CPI, um, it's. Uh, we know that it's not the Fed's preferred measure for inflation. They like the PCE, but um, the CPI does affect uh, a lot of people. There's a lot of things that are tied to it. For example, Social Security. So the Social Security is an average of, I think it's July, August, and September. And so that's um, what, what people's compensation annual increases are impacted by. But we wanted to look at the number because the number came in a little bit warmer, a little hotter than expected. The month over month came in at uh, 0.4 and 0.3 was expected. The headline numbers were higher, but the core numbers were in line. And we we didn't really see initially, at least, uh, the market reaction. So this is an intraday chart of the S&P 500. And that, that, those numbers are reported when the market opens. And we didn't really see any change, although this is what Greg and I are talking about is what happened at one o'clock. Um, there was some sort of a sell off here, but the market didn't the morning when the CPI report was released, even though it was a little hotter than expected. We'll dive a little bit into the numbers there. There wasn't a reaction, um, at, at least a big negative reaction to those to those numbers. Um, I I do this spreadsheet here, which is a little bit wonky. So the S and P the um, the CPI report includes hundreds of items. So this is a a list of all of the items, and a survey is done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they look at everything from ham to bananas to gasoline and floor coverings and watches, and there's just hundreds of items that they do a survey and look at the month over month change, and then that gets reported. So I. I've got sorted by the biggest changes. And so what went up, the, the biggest changes increases, not a surprise because oil is still uh, significant. We'll talk a little bit about oil later on in this episode, but fuel oil, motor oil, photographic equipment, which is obviously not very important, uh, gasoline, miscellaneous personal goods, uh, recreational reading, milk. These are the items that had the biggest changes. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we see, uh, jewelry, watches, used cars, and trucks. And these are the things that actually went down. So this is sorted by the things that changed the most. The gray bars are the important things or the importance. So this table sorts by importance. And so these are the things that are weighted heavily in the CPI more heavily. So rent of shelter, which was up 0.6% month over month, uh, significant number, uh, medical care services, transportation services. So Based on importance, you just if you just squint your eyes and say what's based on importance, what's happening with inflation, and you see more orange bars going to the right. I mean, there's some significant ones to the left, but probably not enough to overall swing this thing in the direction that it needs to go. We still have inflation going up. So that's uh, my high-level 
summary of that, Greg. What are your thoughts on on the CPI numbers? Yeah, I think that it's proving that it's sticky. You know, there was there's been hope for a long time that the CPI would be coming down a lot faster than it was, and a lot of the core components are just sticky. And I think it paints the picture that the Fed is going to have to stay higher for longer if they're going to stick by their guns of trying to uh, drop inflation back to the 2% range. Um, so I, what what does that mean for equities? Well, it's it, it's a tough road forward if, if uh, the Fed has to stay higher for longer. That's not going to be great for earnings. Uh, costs are are higher to borrow uh, if that's the case. It also creates another alternative for investment other than just stocks. You know, for years we had talked about uh, the only game in town, um, Tina. There is no alternative to the S&P. That was the only place to go to get yield. There's a lot of money going to different places right now um, creating yield. Uh, I saw Mohammed El Arian today talk about basically saying he's going to cash um, on most things because he's okay earning a very short term, basically very short term treasuries that he's looking at earning four or five percent yield uh, instead of putting it in longer term bonds, which have really struggled. That's a story. Maybe yeah, I'm not a I'm not a bond trader. We need to find a bond trader to bring on here. Um, who can maybe give us a perspective of Bianca. what's going on in the long bond and if and and the the economic ramifications of it? Um, but I don't know. For me, the the CPI report was it wasn't earth shattering. It wasn't oh no, inflation is screaming back up again. But you're know, right in what you said. Did you read Sam Ryan's newsletter? I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but I, I read the first part. I didn't get all the way through it. Yeah. So basically he said, it's whatever you want it to be. <laughs> yeah. If you want it to be disinflationary, then look at you know, X food, energy, and shelter. It's definitely disinflationary. You want it to be sticky, then you can definitely find sticky parts. And you want to see that there's a wage, wage price spiral that's there. It's it's there. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it's, it's it, it, parts of it were hot, parts of it were cold. And I think the market... Well, what we wanted to ask, well, the reason we look at this, so the, I think it's a good question for everybody to ask, why Why are we talking about this? And the reason we, we talk about this is because we want to know what the Federal Reserve is going to do. And is the Federal Reserve going to raise policies? And today's numbers, if we, this is the CME's uh, FedWatch tool. And I like to look at this just to, not so much for the numbers, but the change in numbers. And so the current FOMC policy is 525-550, and um, the probability yesterday of us being there in January was 69, and today it's 64. So there's a there was a today's numbers slightly shifted the market's perception of the Fed's need to raise rates. And you and I didn't talk about this at the show, but I know you're good with curveballs. And so we did get the FOMC minutes this week. Uh, that were released. And the minutes clearly came out that uh, the FOMC, uh, this is for last month, is concerned. And I think the consensus was pretty clear that they they think there may be a need for more rate hikes. I mean, I think that it wasn't off the table. And I think if you look at today's CPI data, it certainly didn't dissuade anybody. It didn't convince anybody we don't need to raise rates. I mean, if inflation was uber low, being on key or a little bit high, I mean, that's probably in line with the Fed sentiment. My my gut, my over under, and I may be 60% probability that we do raise rates. And I, I don't know when. Um, I don't think it's going to be in November. But I, I do think um, that we have at least another quarter point in our horizon, especially if we see inflation um, not turning around. I mean, it's reaccelerating. Keep in mind that this inflation being positive means that prices are getting more expensive. So inflation coming down, you're still accelerating. You're just not going as fast, like a rocket going to outer space. It's it maybe it's the rate at which it's gaining speed is going down, but it's still gaining speed. So prices are still going up, and, and it, with three point seven percent, that's pretty significant for consumers and. 
Um, I think the Fed is likely to raise rates, in my opinion, but the market seemed to be okay with it, both in the FedWatch tool and then in the S&P 500 as well. Yeah, you know, the hard part about the market, and I've said this for a while, I don't want to sound like the uber long-term bear on things. We're still dealing with a market, in my opinion, that has been artificially and exponentially pumped higher through passive investments in ETF flows, trillions of dollars in COVID liquidity. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> that balloon will run out eventually. It's not out yet. There's still, you go look at the, the Fed balance sheet, you go look at the, the amount of liquidity that's still in the system. There's still a lot of it. And there's still time, I think, for the Fed to try to normalize things um, but the other side of that is we sit in a really overvalued world from a debt standpoint. Um, and I think that's, you know, I'm going back to the recording we did, um, the episode we did with Horace Taft. This is several months ago when we talked about the insane amounts of, uh, of debt. Uh, what did we, we, we surpassed what 33 trillion this week was the, was the headline number. Uh, in in U.S. debt, and we keep going up in rates. Uh, this this debt continues to get more and more expensive. Um, so I don't know. Maybe there is maybe still some some reason to be uh, concerned about the next few months. I agree with you. The Fed is probably not going to raise rates again in November, but maybe December. Maybe maybe it will depend on what happens whether we actually have a Speaker of the House by then or not. Yeah, that's a, before we go to that Speaker of the House thing, I did want to say, jump on what you talked about here. This is this is the year-to-date performance of the S&P 500. And I mean, just the big green things, there's only a few of them, but they're big. And these are, this is the S&P 500 and each, the area of each block is uh, the market, cap, you know, proportional to the market capitalization. And definitely we, Heard about these these big mega companies, the Apple, Amazon, Google, Nvidia, Microsoft, Tesla, and Meta, Facebook, all taking all of the gains. And that if you look at the rest of the S and P five hundred, it's it does look like a like a patchwork. And this is what's changed since we've gone away from a zero interest rate policy: is that people have to be picking stocks, and that there are, there are winners and losers um, sometimes in sectors. But but also even within sectors you'll see green and red so so it's, it does go back to a, probably a more traditional market like what I'm used to trading back in 2007 and eight when fundamentals mattered and companies traded on their own merits um, not just based on the fact that the Federal Reserve is pumping steroids into everything so I'm I'm actually a little bit more bullish for the rest of the year I think we've got earnings season that starts in in full tomorrow bankings or banks are reporting tomorrow uh, I think we're gonna get a a mixed bag on banking. I think there's a spectrum of companies and we still have some things from the banking crisis, the regional banking crisis that are still going to play out. But I think there's going to be some significant winners. I'm I'm actually betting pretty big. I think you're, I don't know if you trade Zion Bank anymore, but I think Zion is going to do well. I think Wells Fargo is going to do well. Uh, I think those, there's a spectrum of companies and I think we're going to see some banks uh, that are, that are going to underperform. But I think it's a stock picker's market and, and fundamentals matter. At some point, we should talk about Eli Lilly looking at this thing, though. And, I was at- and so that's funny that you brought up Eli Lilly. I I looked at that and I'm like, is Eli Lilly really bigger than Walmart now? It is. Market cap wise, Eli Lilly is bigger than Walmart. Um, but before you go away from Zions, here's a I just wanted to throw a little note. There was an article I read today about Zions. Um that the insiders, there's been a lot of insider buying uh, in huge amounts in inside of U.S. Bank, or sorry, inside of not U.S. Bank, uh, in Zions Bank Corp. Um, and I've always said there's a number of reasons why an insider, and, and by insider, I don't mean illegal trade. I mean insiders like the CEO and board of directors members who have inside information, they can buy and sell shares as long as they disclose it properly and with proper timing. And, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of reasons why an insider will sell shares. And it doesn't always mean they don't yeah. believe in the company more. 
a lot of times it's just that's the bulk of their wealth and that's the way they make their you know turn their money that they've made in their stock that they own into profits and cash for their company for, for their family but there's only one reason they buy shares and that's because they believe the the stock's going up yeah um so when you see insider buying that's usually a pretty good sign Right. Um, the, I know they a lot of people feel, focus like focus on insider selling, and that's like somebody wants to buy a new house or get the new yacht or whatever, so they're going to sell shares. Or sometimes they have programmatic selling, but for whatever reason. But buying shares usually um, that's a, a, a positive sentimental indicator. I, I'm with you on that one. But let's um, let's pivot to um, so the Federal Reserve. We just talked about the Fed. We think the Fed is probably going to. I think they're going to raise rates. What's your thought on what the Fed I do in is? December? I think they're going to have to. Okay. I think we're going to get another hot report in November. I don't think they'll do it in November. Um, but I think we're going to get maybe some, maybe a little hotter inflation data coming out in November. Um, and then they're, I think they're going to move in December. Well, a couple other things that are good. Th thanks for those thoughts on that. There are a couple other things that are on our radar that maybe not on everybody else's radar. You and I were talking a little bit about, you know, the fact that we don't have a Speaker of the House. And there's a, some very interesting discussions about how that happened. And really, it was 10 Republicans who made it happen. Um, pretty amazing. But the rules changed. And um, whether you like it or not, it is what it is. Um, but there's some significant things that could be impacted by Congress um, not having a Speaker of the House in place. So first of all is the fact that we were going to shut the government down and we and um Speaker McCarthy was able to negotiate a deal and effectively kick the can down the road to uh, November 17th. So if we don't have a speaker of the house, I I find it hard to believe that we're going to be able to come to some resolution. So November 17th we're going to be faced with with more government shutdown. The other impact is um is aid to uh, both Ukraine and to Israel. Again, not looking for people's political opinions here. I'm sure we have strong emotions on that, um, but um, that probably isn't going to move forward, at least not move forward or easily with us without a speaker. Uh, we do have an acting speaker, in, but basically they're taking care of the administrative stuff. And then finally, uh, legislation. There's three or four big um, things that are due to go in front of Congress. Those include legislation on stable coins, uh, the um, cannabis banking legislation, and then also the um, the Credit Card Competition Act, which is, came under Dick Durbin, which is supposed to be more friendly for consumers and small businesses, uh, reduce credit card fees uh, and transaction fees for small businesses. So we'll see how that plays out. If it's going to play out, but it, you know we're not going to move forward on that without a speaker of the house. Now, your thoughts on the fact that we have a Congress that isn't going to get anything done, Greg? Well, we haven't had a Congress that's got anything done since 1993. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, okay. Well, well, is it good for the market or bad for the market? Oh, is it? <laughs> um, you know. It's bad for the market if we shut the government down. And so if we if we're if we're in a situation where we don't have a speaker by the time we've kicked the can down the road, like you said, that's going to be really bad for the market. If we go into shutdown um, in in November, that now, that's this is a different shutdown. This is this is not like the this this shutdown is not like the other shutdown that we were going to have this after this earlier this summer where we don't pay dividends or we don't pay yield on anything. This, we just, everybody gets, well, what happens is all the government employees take a draw from their credit unions and they get paid later. And we shut down yeah. the national parks and, but everything else still functions. So it's, it's not a, the critical debt. We rating. won't get our data though, right? We don't get our economic data. So that's the risk. My, I'll take the other side of it. I think it's going to be good for the economy. You think it's going to be good? I think it's going to be good for the economy. I think uh, <laughs> that it's, you know, the, the, it's the fear of legislation uh, that causes markets to go down and not a deadlock Congress tends to be good for markets. 
So that's, uh, I, I don't think it's good for the country. I don't think it's the right thing. I'm not trying to celebrate it or, or anything, but you're certainly not seeing it. If you, if you look at the S and P 500 and how it's performing just over the past week or so uh, in light of some of the major geopolitical <laughs> events that are happening and, you know, kicking our speaker out, um, you know, but in hindsight, I think if you told somebody this is what's going to go on, how do you think the market's going to react? I'd probably, my initial reaction would be, I'll, I'll buy puts because I think the market's going to go down. Uh, but it, it, and now that it's happened and we see what the market seems to be pretty much okay with it. Yeah, we'll see. We'll okay. see what we'll see what comes. I, you know, the I do still expect some volatility. I'm actually pretty optimistic going into the end of the year too, even with the, you know, the horrible stuff that's going on in the Middle East. It's something the market, I'm actually very, shouldn't say pleased about what's going on because it's just, no. I, I'm I'm happy that the market has been able to absorb the bad news um, and the, to, to give us a second active hot war in the world is not a good thing. Um, so it's, um, at least it's not a good thing for consumer confidence. Um, I, I wish they, you know, would quit that. I, it creates opportunity, I think in sectors. I, I mentioned this, I did a, a daily market update for options animal. This was last week. Was that the first part of this week? I don't remember. Right after, oh, no, it was the first part of this week. It was on Monday. Um, and I talked about remembering back in in 2003, 2002. First part of 2002, right after the tech bubble had bottomed. Um, obviously, we had September 11th happen, 2001. We went on our war on terror at, here in the United States. And then... You know, the market was still falling uh, because of the internet bubble bursting. The, the, the Twin Tower attacks didn't help. Consumer sentiment was terrible. And what marked the bottom in the S&P 500 at that time is when we invaded Iraq, looking for weapons of mass destruction. Um, yeah. There's a long-term chart that goes through all these geopolitical crises, and it's incredibly morbid. But if you look at where those are, they tend to be local bottoms. That if you see where all of these invasions and these um, major um, military actions have taken place, that they were unfortunately buying opportunities, which is I mean, it just it. I think it's repugnant to try and make money on it. But I, I'm showing the charts here: the S and P 500, the S and P 500. We're getting technical bullish signals with the crossovers and the moving average, the RSI and the MACD. And then if you go over to the price of oil, oh, that's not it, to the price of oil. I mean, we're, we've got oil. This is a one-year chart of oil. Um, maybe there were people who were expecting this to happen back in September. It was why we saw oil heading towards 100. And now oil's you know coming back down. So I know that um, that Israel and Palestine are not oil producing countries, but certainly they're in the region and they have neighbors who certainly are involved in it. Um, and so we're not seeing impacts on on oil or in the market yet. So it's, I guess that's a good thing from that standpoint. Yep, that's what I agree. So we'll see. All right. Well, hopefully these updates are helpful. Um, any Anything else you're watching coming up to earnings? Uh, I'm interested to see how the consumer's going to do um, right now. So I'm going to look at, you know, consumer facing companies, uh, companies like Costco, companies like Apple. Very interested to see how Apple does this quarter. Um, typically, you, this is usually not Apple's best quarter uh, when it comes to blowout earnings. So, but I, I want to see how the consumer is doing. If the consumer's staying resilient uh we can work through this inflation issue as long as they can keep staying resilient um so that's really what i'm looking at how's the consumer spending doing yeah some some banking earnings are starting uh next week um i'm going to be watching um tesla um i, I think um 
there'll be a lot of focus on deliveries uh, in gross margin x the credits um they trade credit so we'll see i'm i'm in a position of an in the money cover call on uh on tesla i think i'll adjust it into a call and trade to give me some protection because i think it'll it'll be pretty volatile um the other one we probably should dive into is is eli Lilly. i i mean this this Ozempic thing is huge. I'm, I'm sure you've seen some of the writing on that. Um, I, I need to process more. I just saw a report this morning that the Mojano, the the estimated revenues came out, uh, or revenues came out at 14, uh, 1.4 billion versus 1.2 billion forecast. So this, uh, the addressable market that are using these DLP1 inhibitors is something like 0.5% of the uh, of the people who would be eligible for it. And you you saw the move from Walmart on Friday, right? You saw that last Friday with Walmart. Yeah, and that's Walmart knows how many people they know. What Walmart came out and said is, um, people who are buying Ozempic are spending less money on food. That's a fact because they know who you are when you go into Walmart. You, your your credit cards tracked, so they know what you do and what you spend. And so their clients uh, who normally are spending less money, the people who are buying. Uh, these DLP one inhibitors, and so far it's it's ninety nine point five percent of the people are not that are eligible that would be eligible are not taking it. So, and it affects all kinds of different stuff. I mean, it's um, they're saying that they're concerned. I saw a piece from Bank of America saying that banking on uh, um, gambling companies um, could do poorly because the Ozempic reduces people's desires for compulsive behaviors. So people who who gamble or drink or smoke all of those it's not just food and I'm just thinking with there's a lot of people with a lot of problems and if this is a cure-all solution um and you lose weight along the way it's i don't know <laughs> this stock which is, which is trading where's uh it's it's pretty pricey it's got a pe of uh 86 it's trading today at 610 um, 610 sounds like a lot of money, but you know, I, we've seen stocks that have traded for 2000 or 3000 a share. Um, Look at Chipotle. Although that might be, you know, Chipotle might be, I think I have some, uh, compulsive behavior surrounding Chipotle. So <laughs> seriously, their burritos are so good. <laughs> the, the nearest Chipotle is like 30 miles from me. So I have to like drive a long ways to get to one. They need, to, they need to build. They need to build one here. They're one of the companies that are going to be benefiting from AI. I don't know if you've seen. They have Chipotle robots that that make the bowls and the burritos now. So, yeah. Anyways, we're going a little bit long, but that's <laughs> Eli Lilly is a company to put on your watch list. I can see this stock being at twelve hundred in a year. I, I'm. I, if you look at this chart here, you say, "Wow, that's that's crazy." I mean, it's basically doubled since March. And the thing is, this has been on my watch list all year, and. Um, I've been talking a lot about it over the past month or so and kind of kicking myself for not moving sooner when it was at a 520 with, you know, $90, a hundred dollars ago. Um, so yeah. You do realize that if it's a $1,200, it's, it's bigger than, uh, is it bigger than Amazon? It, it well, it's, it's as big as Amazon at $1,200 market cap wise. Yeah, who knows? Well, the other company is uh, Novo Nordisk, but let's start doing some research on these DLP1 inhibitors. It's there's some interesting stuff going on there. Cool. Well, it's good to talk to you, friend. Thanks, folks, for, for listening to us. Hopefully, you got a few ideas today and, um, and looking next forward week, to a special treat, right? Yeah, we got an episode next week. We've got uh, Lady K on with us. So, those of you that maybe some of you know Karen, we're going to. If you have questions for Karen, uh, we're going to ask her some uh, some of the obvious questions, like how did you get into trading options, and tell us about some of your favorite stocks and trades. And if you have any specific questions you'd like for us to ask Karen, maybe uh, you know, ask her to maybe we can get her to do a Zumba demonstration or something for us. I'm sure she'll probably give me grief about how well the Dodgers did in the playoffs. Ah, uh, yeah, probably too. So kind of like you did before the show, but that's all right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Derek. See you. Thanks. Bye.